Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning into my podcast, John Walker's Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Everything is Moving by Cassie Walker, a book about our journey to the jungle, available now on Amazon.com. And now for today's podcast, please welcome Adam Siska. How you doing, buddy? I'm great. When did you uh, start playing music? I started playing music. Well, music I started pretty young. Like when I lived in the Virgin Islands, I got a steel drum. Okay. And and uh, I wouldn't say that I was like particularly good at it, but in my kindergarten, we would take music classes. Like uh, I, I learned to play like. Uh, hot cross buns and like shoe fly don't bother me so like that you know um and then when i came to chicago i took piano lessons in oak park i didn't really take to it like there was something about like the the piano and like i guess the way that i was taking lessons in more of like a classical format that like i just didn't really gravitate towards i also didn't really have much of an ear or any sort of like knack for playing yeah um, and the summer going into the eighth grade, my buddy Kyle, who actually passed away this last year, he, he called me up and we hadn't really spoken all summer, but he like put on his guitar over the phone and he showed me that glycerin by Bush. And when I come around by green, by green day, were like the same chords. <laughs> so I like got on my bike and I rode over to his house and he taught me how to play it. And, uh, so I learned those two songs like wow. simultaneously. He unlocked the secret. <laughs> and then I learned Iron Man by Black Sabbath. And like he taught me how to read tablature and like that's kind of where it started. And I started doing like slap bass and stuff like that just because without a drummer, like being a bass player. Well, I guess I should touch on that. I, I had a guitar first, like a really lousy Stratocaster. And I was trying to get into bands, but I wasn't very good at it. So I bought a, a jazz bass. And by owning a bass, it was like I was in like five bands immediately. Yeah, they are hard to come by. Right. Like nobody knew what that was or like nobody want, nobody asked their parents for a bass for Christmas. Everybody got a guitar at like all around that same time, seventh, eighth grade. So when people were putting bands together, basically it was like, OK, well, I have one. And uh, so I got into every band and then it turned out there was this kid, Chris Marinello from my school who also had a bass and was actually really good at it. So I got kicked out of like every band mm. and, and replaced by him. And uh, that was kind of like, it was a slow start for me. Like he, he lit the fire under you though. He, yeah. I mean, I would learn like half songs, you know, little riffs and stuff like that. And then my brother started a band with Bill Beckett. And uh, Bill was the drummer of the band. It was called Gang Green. Mm. And they wrote original songs. And like. This was this was before Remember Maine. This was like a couple years before Remember Maine. And uh, my brother and this guy, Trevor, wrote songs. And like they were, you know, like for being like early high school it was promising you know like it wasn't good by any means but it sounded like i mean they were writing songs so like that was a pretty huge thing to do like impressive yeah and uh bill was the drummer and then he came in and wrote he had a song that he wrote i guess it was like the first song he ever wrote and it was way better than the other songs like right off the bat it was like He didn't particularly have like a great voice, but his song just had like the elusive, like in songwriting, like you could point to it and say like, that's that song, (laughs) you know, like, uh, right. He had a style, right. Like that's a hard thing to come by even for like professional songwriters is like, how do you make something that like you can talk about when it's over and would potentially make you want to listen again? Yeah. That's not just a replica of your favorite band. Right. And, and so Bill wrote a song and I remember coming down in my basement and just being like, holy shit, like this guy, 
it's not necessarily good, but it's like <laughs> way, it's way better than anything I've ever heard. Right. And, uh, so I started just kind of gravitating towards Bill and, uh, when I got to high school, we kind of became better friends like that band with my brother kind of dissolved. And when he started doing remember Maine, I basically just like aligned myself to be like the merch guy and be as close to that as possible. And then through that, I, I met the fallout boy guys when he started playing at back to the office, which is ultimately, I guess where I first saw you play with, uh, Crav Car and the Flying Hawaiian. What was his name? Right. Uh, Sean Ernst. Fair, Farewell Night. Yeah, but it was pre Farewell Night. It was okay. uh, Centerfold. Well, Centerfold, exactly. Wow. I still have I have a flyer with Centerfold, and uh, so like that was really like, you know, I didn't really I wasn't like a prolific player by any means, but I started to like see that there was something that I could align myself with, and like instead of going to like the football games at Barrington high school on Friday nights, I would go there. I would go to nights to Columbus or Elk Grove teen center. And I mean, within a couple of weeks I became friends with like Pete Wentz and Patrick Stump and Troman and like those guys. And I mean, I was a lot younger than most of them, but for whatever reason they decided I was like cool enough to hang out. Yeah. It was such a specific time. It was such, there were so many things going on uh, at back to the office, which was this like, dive bar that allowed all ages shows on monday nights it was unbelievable and yeah. what what I've, I've actually been writing about that time period a lot like i, I don't know what i'm going to do with that but i've just like i've realized that like even once the academy is in fallout boy and you know and, and you playing with panic and stuff like that like once there was people from that that like went to like a national and international stage like i mean that part was obviously really exciting but to me, when I look back at those early, like 2002 through 2004, like that to me was like the most exciting time of my life, even, right. you know, <laughs> um, it felt like I was part of something that, I mean, looking back on it now, like it is legendary. And, uh, I think I knew, I think I knew that already then, but it was something like, even on the smallest scale, it just felt special. And like, I, I was so happy to be a part of it. Yeah. I know. I, I, I specifically remember, remember not ever really feeling doubt that none of us weren't going to make it, you know, it always seemed like, yeah, we're playing shows. It's growing. This is what's happening. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think I really knew what made it was right. just because like the thing that I was holding up, like as like the Holy grail of like what it could be was such a small thing. Like, I remember Academy starting and being like, we're going to be as big as Fairweather, <laughs> which like most, most of the people listening to the podcast probably don't know who that is. Right. I do. Right. Like I liked them a lot and I thought they were ambitious and like, that's what we were trying to be. And like those bands felt huge to me. Like I remember going to see Coheed and Cambria at the Fireside Bowl and I got there at like 2 PM. Cause I was like, there's no way there's not going to be a line like heading eastbound all the way downtown to try to see this band they're amazing <laughs> and i got there and there was nobody in line yet it was freezing cold i had to like take shelter in that domino's pizza in fullerton that's still there it was like the stupidest thing ever that i went that early but like it felt colossal sure. and and eventually within a couple of years it, it was and it like i think it redefined the music business at a time where like napster was really raining on the parade i think it created a new platform for how you can be in a band and ultimately it's one that like i think around 2010 everyone involved in emo started to kind of feel like ashamed of the genre and like the the whole thing but a decade after that i feel like i'm really proud of it yeah that's that's the thing with growing up i think you're mm -hmm. always, you know there's there's something strange about hindsight yeah, like, I mean, I think at the time, 2010 or whatever, it was like a healthy thing for everyone to like, just kind of be like, I don't know, this is kind of turned into hair metal in a way. Right, what do we do now? Yeah, like, I mean, when we were getting into the band, like 2002, 2003, all that time, like, 
I don't think there was ever an element of like, we want to be rock stars. We want to be larger than life. And by like, by 2008 or nine, it started to feel that way. Right. Like there was a, there was a big disconnect with the audience. Um, some people had become millionaires. Other people were moving back in with their parents. You know, it was a, it's a weird thing. It was just, yeah, a strange dichotomy for sure. Right. And there was like no middle class in, in the music business. And I, I still find that. And yeah. It's all or nothing. I've been kind of trying to navigate my way out of the music business and I, I don't really know where to go, but, but, uh, I hear you. Yeah. It's, uh, so when the, when the Academy started though, you guys were already kind of, cause Bill was already pretty well known and you guys kind of came out of the gate. You already had, you already were signed to a, the, a local label and you put out an EP that ended up doing really well. Well, you put out, uh, like demos first that did really well. They did. And then, so how long was the Academy of Band before you guys got signed to Fuel by Ramen? So we started in March of 2003. And that spring, like that late spring, early summer, we already signed to LLR, Little League Records in Chicago, and put out that EP that like next winter. And then, so the, the spring slash summer of 2004, so like a year and a half of being a band, we signed to Feel by Robin. Wow. Yeah. And like, then all of a sudden I remember you guys are on tour with like Less Than Jake and... That was the first tour. Some of our favorite bands growing up. Yeah. I, uh, before Academy, I got kicked out of a Less Than Jake cover band. <laughs> And uh, for what? <laughs> for but not being good at bass. Uh, sure. <laughs> I uh, to play in like a ska band, you have to like be walking, playing these like you know, kind of like, like jazz influenced bass lines and like. Uh, and skanking at the same time. Yeah, totally. Which I'm good at that part, <laughs> but like, uh, ska is like harder than reggae, even because like reggae is a little more like trance, like you're in like a repetitive groove. Scott can be like walking all over the place and like, um, yeah, I mean, I couldn't hang in that band. I mean, they were just doing like, uh, covers of like gold. It was like covers of like every song from like Tony Hawk pro skater, you know? Right. And, uh, but I got kicked out Damn. and cause I got my first girlfriend, Ashley Brooks. Uh, Shout out. I started, I, st <laughs> I started hanging out with her instead of, going to band practice because i wasn't fun they would like make fun of me for being bad so like very quickly i got replaced by like a guy who could actually play and i was bummed about it but then like a year and a half later i was on tour with less than jake yeah. and it felt so, it felt so great <laughs> so like and i had like gotten like a little bit better at bass but not really much <laughs> like but it felt so great to come to school and just be like hey everybody i'm leaving to i'm leaving school for a month to go on tour with less than Jake. Like how's your cover band though? Yeah. <laughs> See you later. It, it was a special time. Man. Yeah. Was what fun. was, what was the time like in your guys' lives when you got signed to field by ramen? It was crazy because nobody really knew what that was. So like saying we got signed to field by ramen was basically like, I mean, it meant, it meant nothing to most people. And like, even I kind of knew who they were when we signed, I only knew who they were because Fall Out Boy had just signed with them. Mm -hmm. But they were just kind of like getting a little more involved with like the major label scene because Less Than Jake had signed to like uh, Sire Records, Warner Brothers. So like they started to get like, a, I think they got a good distribution deal right before then. And when we signed, it was like, whoa, so we're going to have a record that's going to be for sale in like record stores and like and with, with the first EP that we put out, it was like, we sold it at Record Breakers in Chicago and like online on like absolutepunk.net, you know, um, stuff like that. But writing almost here, knowing that there was going to be like national distribution, it changed the way we thought about what kind of record we wanted to make. And I think that's why if you were to listen to that EP, which most people haven't, but if you listen to it and then you listen to Almost Here, you can tell we knew 
I mean, we were not necessarily aiming for like commercial success, but we were definitely trying to like broaden like what we were doing. And the EP that we did was very abstract. It was like a conceptual record, kind of influenced more by like Coed and Cambria and Gatsby's American Dream and these kind of more like ambitious uh, conceptual artists. And almost here took a lot more of like a direct approach. And I think we were really trying to like just make something that people who were listening to Take This to Your Grave by Fall Out Boy would probably appreciate our record. We were trying to like definitely ride the coattails as much as we could. And it was, we were successful with it, obviously. like Yeah, you were one of the only Chicago bands that didn't record with Sean O'Keefe. Yeah, we had our own thing. And it's funny, we, we worked with James Paul Wisner on that record. And he did the first couple of dashboard confessional records, which at the time, like, I mean, it couldn't have been bigger to us. Like right. knowing that we were going to go make a record with that guy was fucking insane. Um, so he did like the Gatsby's American dream record. He did under oath record right be right before he did ours. He did the under oath record, which is kind of their biggest album. And, uh, so we called him, Mike Carden called him and he was like, we want to do the record with you. We have like nine grand to make the record, which if you're not familiar with the music business, uh, nine grand is not a big budget to make an album. Yeah. Um, you know, I Half mean, it of sounds that is like flying a, you guys to Florida. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which we didn't do. We drove in, in our oh, 15 wow. passenger van, uh, through the night to St. Cloud, Florida, where he lived. And, uh, but we, we told him how much money we had to make the record. We, he heard, he listened to the EP and didn't really care for it. And he turned us down. And Mike Carden called him a few days later and said, I really think you should do this record. If you do it, it'll change your life. <laughs> Which is like, that's like such a classic Mike Carden sales pitch. Yeah. Uh, Easy and enough. He said, and he was like, okay, I'll do it. So he agreed. Wow. How old were you? I was, I had just turned 16. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so we got to work writing the record and we wrote that record in consecutive order. Like uh, we wrote like attention to be the first song on the record. Right. And then like, we were like, okay, so if we open the song with this kind of like call to arms, attention, attention, the second song should then be like palm muted in this kind of like driving lockdown sort of like uh, dynamically like more down kind of song. So we wrote that song season and then we were like, okay, the third song should be like the single. <laughs> so we wrote slow down and like everything really like came together like that. And the last song on the record, uh, almost here, um, the outro of it, we like basically ganked the last song on, Stay What You Are by Saves the Day, which kind of had this like anthemic sort of like, it felt like the end of the record. Um, so it was very deliberate in terms of like how we wrote it. Yeah, and it's kind of reminiscent to your guys' conceptual first EP. You guys are obviously think thinking a lot about presentation. <laughs> yeah, and like we didn't present almost here as a concept record, but in many ways I think it was a better concept record than the first EP um, Almost Here was a record about kids from the suburbs using music as a vehicle to escape that sort of monotonous, like, doldrums of suburban life. Right. Um, it was basically like, how do we go somewhere that's not Woodfield Mall? You know, it was like, how do we go see what's out there? And we're going to write the record. If you listen to it lyrically, it's about us. Right. And I think that's why we had trouble ever recreating that because as soon as like there was any sort of success, MTV, a little bit of money, a budget, uh, screaming fans and stuff like that, I don't think we really knew who that character was anymore. And so it, and so it goes. Yeah. And I think that's like obviously a really common sort of like sophomore slump, you know, but I mean, it, it 
looking back on it, I like I wish we had written two records before we ever put out almost here. Yeah. You know? I mean, the writing process was so smooth in a way. I mean, we argued a lot, but like it seemed to be like so easy to do. And I do think a lot of that uh, had to do with the dynamic between the three of us, Bill, Mike and I and AJ Latrace and Mike Del Principe, um, who, you know, looking back on it a decade later or almost now 20 years later for those guys, like, I really wish we hadn't fired them from the band. And uh, the dynamic was so fragile. And I see that now that the fact that it worked at all, don't change what's working, you know? I was in a band called 504 Plan and we broke up and the guitar player of that band, Tom Conrad, ended up joining your band, The Academy Is. Yep. Um, And then I ended up coming on tour with you guys and I you was, did. yeah, I was a guitar tech and I, f- I filmed you guys and I, I tried to edit stuff. I think I might've been out of my element a little bit, but I remember that. You know being... what? I, I, I've gone back and looked at that and, and I like the editing. I really like the style of those early. John was the original director of TAI TV for anyone that doesn't mm-hmm. know that. And I mean, that was a very like loose concept of what that was even going to be. And I think your creative input on it kind of helped shape what it became for us. The little Flanagan and Mr. James. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Double I duel. Do. Yeah, double <laughs> duel. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, like that, that became a huge part of our like culture in our band. And like when the second record like wasn't selling what the label wanted it to and all that kind of stuff like that that connection that we have with our fan base through doing those like webisodes ti tv in a way like became like as valuable as our music right and and i think that made us really uncomfortable in a way just because we wanted obviously we wanted to be known for our songwriting um but i do think that we were like in a way like pioneers of like this new medium of like interacting with your audience and it was a lot of fun yeah you guys seemed it was definitely seemed ahead of its time considering now everybody in a band usually at least has like a podcast or some sort of video content to coincide with their music even if it's just like instagram story and right. stuff like that like none of that existed like i mean tia tv when you were directing it like i don't think we even had ever heard of like youtube before it was like a very it was a new thing that like maybe like some people were, were privy to, but like when we were doing it, it was like not even for YouTube. It was for, um, we would like, we put that like TV screen on the website. I don't know if you remember that. Like if you went to the academy com, it was just like a picture of like an right, old right. tube television. Like, uh, I don't know. That was really big. I mean, I don't know that like the lasting power that our band has had, would have even been there if it wasn't for the ability to like show them who we were. Right. And at least for me as like the bass player, who's like definitely not like the vocal, like front man of the band or anything like being able to like do the skits and all that stupid, but fun kind of stuff, like really helped me like interact with that fan base in, in a way that like, I'm still enjoying like the, the impact that it had like when i go out in chicago and people come out to see me dj or when people came out to see me play with the band say anything or when i play with carly ray jepson like that stuff and that character that i was able to like develop and show them like it had staying power so yeah so yeah what what happened to the academy is you know what i looking back on it what i what i think happened to the academy is we touched on it a little bit ago where we lost sight of like that character from almost here and like that drive of like getting out of the suburbs and like having an impact. Like I think as soon as we started touring on a bus, which is actually when you first came out with us was our first bus tour. I think that's when like new levels of dysfunction started to like almost like a cancer in our creative process. Like there's a certain comfort level that came with touring on a bus that I don't think was, I don't think we were ready for that. Sure. Um, We all of a sudden 
I had the opportunity to watch a movie or play Xbox instead of listen to music together. Or just get or just get wasted because no one has to drive or Right. There was yeah, we just had like this new freedom and comfort that like every band kind of like dreams of, but I think really hurt our creative process that was already in a fragile state having changed two members of the band after making that record. So, you know, I think that was a huge factor in like the internal creative issues that we had. And then the, the other factor I think um, was the arrival of Panic at the Disco, not just the music world, but in like Feel by Ramen and Crush Management, um, the emo scene, like prior to their arrival and like their style of writing and their unbelievable like platform of like imagery and I mean, you were there firsthand, so you yeah. know better than I do. Like, Yeah, it was a force. Yeah, like an unbelievable force and one that I fully respect to this day and like one that I'm still close with to this day. But you guys shared management and label and sometimes even crew with Panic. Yep. Yeah. And uh, still to this day, like a lot of their like core crew are people that had their first jobs working for the Academy is. Um so do you think do you think like the label and in, in, in the management just reprioritized? Yeah, absolutely. And like I don't want to pin our faults on them. Looking back on it, like they were just doing what they always do, which is to maximize profit. And when there's something that's so clear cut, like brilliant, like that fever you can't sweat out was a new thing. I have no reason to believe that they would do anything other than follow that but for uh, for us like prior to that record coming out and their arrival on that scene the whole thing with emo was like kind of this anti-new metal in the way that like nirvana was like anti like hair metal it was like interact with your fan base you're not larger than life you play the show you load out you go to the merch table you talk to the fans it's like some of the most personable down to earth musicians you'll ever meet because it's like this blue collar DIY formula. And I think we were like tailor made for success within that platform. Yeah. And when panic at the disco showed up, that platform flew right out the window because they were so, they were larger than life and fallout boy. Wasn't like that. The Academy is wasn't like that. Motion City Soundtrack, May, Armor for Sleep, those bands that were kind of like the norm power players of the scene prior to that were, like I said, in that kind of like DIY, play like 250 plus shows a year in a van. And Panic was like the first band that like, you know, that Nothing Rhymes with Circus Tour was like a full on stadium act, yeah. you know, like. And I don't think we were capable of competing with that. I don't think we were ever meant to. Right. But you were naturally thrown into the mix. Yeah. Naturally, we wanted to compete with it because, you know, we wanted to please the record label and management in the same way that they did. And we also wanted to buy a house and making sure that we would maybe have generational wealth, you know? So it's like, I mean, that's a really hard thing to do. And and shortly after that, you know, Bill became a father, which puts more of a weight on trying to make a lucrative model. And meanwhile, we made a record that was like very counterintuitive to trying to be lucrative. And, and the Sati record was like, we simultaneously wanted to be nothing like a stadium act and we also wanted to be the biggest band in the world. So, like, I don't think we are. As soon as they showed up, I don't think we knew how to do anything natural anymore. You know. When you're looking back on it, do you feel like if there was any sort of um, intervention or like a group therapy kind of situation that the band was able to partake in before you guys broke up? Would that have made any sort of difference? Or do you think it was just kind of meant to be? 
No, I mean, we, we had a lot of problems. You know, a lot of it had nothing to do with any other band or management or label. Um, some of it had to do with the fact of how young we were. Yeah. How, how ambitious we were. Um, how conflicted we were between trying to be meaningfully creative and also lucrative. As far as like group therapy goes, I do think it would have been nice to have somebody from management call and say, Hey guys, like this doesn't happen overnight. You guys are going to build a career. Be grateful for the hundreds and thousands, if not millions of fans you guys have around the world and keep trying to build upon that and super serve that instead of, you know, being envious of like the immediate success that other bands around you are having. Now, I mean, right. you know, that would be the advice I would give. And I still give that to advice to Carly Rae Jepsen. Now I play with her and like, uh, you know, she's kind of like a DIY pop superstar, not necessarily DIY, but like sort of like a, like an underdog in a way, like she had the big hit and then the, the last record wasn't necessarily like commercially a smash, but people loved it and it was really good. And in the major label world, there's a lot of emphasis put on chart topping singles and sales, but that's not all that you need to have a good career. Right. So, yeah. How did you find yeah. that gig? Uh, Tony Marino. So, uh, Tony Marino was, uh, a friend of John and I's back in uh, in the VFW Hall scene. He was the founder of that LLR Records that put out the first Academy record. Mm -hmm. uh, he became the tour manager of the Academy is. He became, wasn't he your bass tech? He was my bass tech in, in, in Panic, and then he ended up tour managing them and still does. Yep, he still does. And then So when he left Academy officially, it was to work for the Jonas Brothers. And then through Jonas Brothers in that gig, he got the Carly job. And it was a funny thing. I was like, I was playing bass for Say Anything, but they didn't really tour a whole lot. And uh, I was working at like a health food store in Vermont. And I was talking to Mike Carden on the phone and I was like, you know, I'd really like to play bass for Carly Rae Jepsen. Too bad she has a bass player. I wish Tony would fire that guy and hire him. And I, and I was just joking. And 48 hours later, my phone rang and Tony was asking me if I wanted to play bass for Carly. Wow. It was like, it was one of those weird things where like, it was like, just felt like I put that out into the world. <laughs> you know, like right. I said it out loud and then within 48 hours, it was, uh, it was happening. And Tony called me and he was like, he was like, what are you doing for the rest of the year? And he called me in the middle of my work day. I started a new job at this like wine and cheese cellar in Vermont. And like, it was a weird time, you know, like coming from the band background, it was weird to like all of a sudden do this kind of like rural, like, like countryside, like wine and cheese vendor. You know, it was like such a weird thing. And, uh, I was my second day on the job and I saw Tony call me and I was like, huh, wow. I haven't talked to him in a while. Wow. I got off work and he called me, I called him back and he was like, what are you doing this year? And I was like, Oh my God, please say what I think you're about to say. And I got the job and it's six years later and I still play for Carly. So yeah. Yeah. Well have fun. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Hopefully I get to see you. It's been a while. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk. Of course. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends. Spread the word. Help the cause. Thank you very much. Have a good day.